Good afternoon, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Michelle Norris, an opinions columnist with The Washington Post. And today we're speaking with Clint Smith. He's the author of the best selling book, How the Word is Passed. It's a book about how, as a country, we have and have not reckoned with the legacy of slavery and the long arm of slavery. Clint, it is so good to be with you. It's so good to be here with you. I loved this book, and I hope I hope this book is widely embraced in people's homes, in America's schools and universities, in America's prisons, in institutions of higher learning, in places where people have influence, in places where people need to be influenced and informed and enlightened by history. So thank you for writing this book. The title itself has an interesting story. Why don't you tell us to start with why you chose this title. Yeah, well, thank you so much for the kind words. Uh, and and the title came from uh, a conversation that were was being had by some descendants of Monticello Plantation. Uh, and so Monticello is where the book begins, um, which is famously the uh, plantation and the home of Thomas Jefferson, our third president of the United States, one of our founding fathers. And Part of what Monticello is doing is has been over the course of the past several years, reimagining and reconceptualizing how they tell the story of enslavement, how they tell the story of Jefferson, how we recognize that Jefferson was, on the one hand, somebody who wrote one of the most important documents in the history of the Western world, and on the other hand, is somebody who enslaved over 600 people over the course of his lifetime, including four of his own children. That he wrote in one document that all men are created equal and wrote in another document that black people are inferior to white people endowment of body and mind. And so they've been grappling with how to tell a more honest, robust story of who Jefferson is. And part of what that means is taking seriously the stories of people who have been enslaved at Monticello. And so they started the Getting Word Oral History Project, which is an initiative to get the sort of oral testimonies of the descendants of people who were enslaved at Monticello, the hundreds of people who were enslaved, uh, descendants of the Hemings family, Ranger family, but, uh, and so many others, and and to try to take seriously what those testimonies mean. And and one of the descendants of a family that was enslaved at Monticello talked about the the oral tradition, sort of heirloom of stories that have been passed down over time. Uh, and he said, "This is how the word is passed down." And I think sometimes as a writer, you come across these quotes or these passages, these moments where you're like, "Oh, okay, like this is it." Um, and so I, I immediately, as I came across that, I knew that that was going to be uh, the title of the book because it captured so much of what the book, uh, so many of the themes that the book was wrapped up with, um, sort of one, one brief summation. One of the things you note in the Monticello chapter that starts the book is Jefferson was aware of his flaws. It wasn't that he was doing this and was, was not aware of the tension you know, between the ideas that he was espousing for a new America and the um, sort of moral conundrum as someone who was an enslaver. Monticello also seems to be aware of its flaws in, in trying to tell its story. It very much is a work in, in progress. Do you have a sense now that you spent time there, that you talked to people who work there, that you talked to people who were visiting there, where it might land in telling this story and how that might help lead America's reckoning in grappling with this story? Yeah, it's a great question. And one of the reasons that I wanted to go to Monticello was because I think that it is, it is I went to places that are staunchly refusing to talk about their relationship to this history. And I went to places that uh, are openly grappling and thinking about it. And it were founded on the principle of refuting so much of the revisionism of American history that we've been inundated with. And so Monticello was this interesting place that was sort of in between, where if you talk to somebody who went to Monticello 10, 20 years ago, their experience in Monticello would have been very different than my own, because it is relatively recently that Monticello has began to incorporate um, a lot of sort of interventions in their curatorial process that make sure that we are, you know, that the visitors who come there are grappling with the totality who Jefferson was and what his legacy was. So only recently in 2018, I think, did they create a tour specifically focused on he uh, Sally Hemings and the Hemingses of Monticello, the Hemings family. Uh, and as many people know, Sally Hemings is the woman with whom Jefferson had uh, seven children, four of whom lived into adulthood. Uh, and she was his enslaved human property. Uh, 
and we cannot understand that relationship to the extent that it can even be called a relationship um, as anything other than something that was uh, animated and shaped um, uh, by the fact that he uh, was her enslaver and she was the enslaved. And so part of what you know Monticello is doing now is saying, this, this place, as much as it belongs to Jefferson, does not just belong to Jefferson. And in more ways, it belongs to the enslaved families, again, the Fawcett's, Grangers, Hemingses, and so many others who lived on this land in many ways for a longer period of time than Jefferson did. Jefferson was away in D.C., Philadelphia, Paris, New York for extended periods of time. And, and it is the, the Black enslaved families who lived on this land over the course of generations, who built that land, who cultivated that land, who made it what it was, who made everything that Jefferson did possible, right? It's not even so much a sort of, this is the bad part of Jefferson and this is the good part of Jefferson. We can recognize that these are two separate things. They're fundamentally entangled with one another. Jefferson doesn't do the things that he does unless he had enslaved labor on his plantation, making it possible for him to write, think, and engage in politics and do all the things while still maintain his home. So I think that a place like Monticello is really unique because it is shifting and changing how it tells the story based on new information that it gets. And I think that these places generally also have a really unique opportunity to reach people. I mean, I think Monticello before the pandemic had almost 500,000 visitors a year, which is more than who will read pretty much any book, uh, more people who read any book about, uh, about slavery. And so in the space of a 60 minute tour, if Monticello is doing it right, they can really, I saw this in real time, really move and, and transform people's understanding of the history of this country by transforming their understanding of the history of Jefferson. And especially when this is also happening at Montpelier and Mount Vernon and, you know, all of these, this, this area in the um, Washington, Maryland, Virginia region is just rich with these kind of opportunities to tell stories, but also to re-examine how stories are told. As a nation, we are in the midst of a uh, very thorny debate over the teaching of a difficult history. And um, and you will notice that I did not say that the teaching of critical race theory, because that is separate and distinct from, from what we're talking about in teaching history, but people try to co-join those two things, to conflate them. Um, but in teaching this history, you recognize why it is important and how it is important in some of the ancillary characters that we meet in your book. So Naya Bates, for instance, dedicates her life to examining these histories because she literally tripped, she found the eye in history uh, mm. by looking at a, at, a, at a family, at a photo um, uh, at a different plantation and realizing that some of her relatives were in that photo. And once she discovered that history, it lived in her in a different way. Um, do you think that that's one of the reasons why people perhaps don't want this kind of history taught is because once you hear it, particularly as a young person, it does perhaps shape the contours of your life. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it shaped the contours of my own life. I mean, part of what this book is doing is an attempt to fill in the gaps of my own childhood, is an attempt to uh, recognize the ways that I, was, uh, that I misunderstood the history of slavery, the way that I failed to be taught adequately about the history of slavery. This book is not written by somebody who, is, uh, who began this book as an expert. Um, on the historiography of slavery. It is written by someone who is attempting to learn about it through my journey to these different places across the country. And, and I hope what the reader feels is that they are on a sort of learning journey alongside me. And, and over the course of four or five years of writing this book, it has been a, an emancipatory and a liberating experience because I think there's so much power in learning the, the totality and the truth of American history. Because once you have that history, once you are armed with that history, and that evidence, this country can't lie to you anymore about why it looks the way that it does. And I think all the time about a 1963 essay by James Baldwin called Talk to Teachers. In it, he says a lot of remarkable things with Elise Baldwin, but one of the things that he says is that the role of the teacher, he's doing, this is based on a speech that he gave to a group of educators in 1963, the role of the teacher is to uh, help ch uh, the black child understand that even though the world tells them over and over and over again that they are criminal, there is something wrong with them. That it is, in fact, the society and the history that created the conditions that that black child is growing up in that is, in fact, and, and for many of us, that's intuitive. But I think I remember being a young black kid growing up in New Orleans and being inundated 
with these messages about like why different parts of New Orleans, why black people lived in the conditions that they, why there's so, why there was so much violence. And when you're a young person, and you, you know, if you're like me, you know that it's wrong, but you don't have the language or the sociology or the history or the framework with which to refute it. And so there becomes this sort of, in my case, there was a sort of intellectual and, and psychological paralysis in which I knew that what I was hearing was wrong, but I didn't know how to say it was wrong. And, and it, it isn't, wasn't until my adult life where I gained so much lexicon and gained deeper understanding of the truth of this history that it felt like had been hidden from me for so long that I was able to say that the reason this one community looks one way and another community looks another way is not simply because of the people in those communities, but it is because of what has been done to those communities generation after generation after generation. Um, and it reminds me too that that our proximity to this period of time is is recent. Like it wasn't that long ago. I think all the time about how the woman who opened the National Museum of African American History and Culture here in Washington D.C. in 2016 was the daughter of an enslaved person, not the granddaughter or the great granddaughter. She was the daughter, of someone born into intergenerational chattel slavery. And so the idea that we would suggest that that history has nothing to do with the contemporary landscape of inequality is so profoundly morally and intellectually disingenuous. And I think that what going to these different historical sites did for me was give me a sense of our physical proximity uh, to this history, which gave me a deeper understanding of our temporal proximity to it. And that sense of intimacy made it so clear uh, that this history that we've to told ourselves was a long time ago wasn't in fact that long ago at all. You know, if you drive a vehicle, you will notice in the rear view mirror, there's little words that can barely see them. Um, they're quite faint, but if you take the time to read them, they say that objects in the mirror appear closer than they appear. Um, that, that applies to our history as well. I appreciated the aperture of your curiosity, that you did not just talk to experts, that you talked to ex-convicts, you talked to tourists, um, you talked to a wide range of people who broadened your understanding and therefore the readers. Um, what did their reactions, not just individually, but overall tell you about this reckoning? Part of what it did was give me a sense of how uh, inconsistent it is throughout this country, that our, our reckoning with history, with history of slavery is, is largely a, a sort of patchwork of experiences. It's a patchwork of memories. Um, and, and how you understand and remember the history of slavery will largely depend on where you were growing up or where you were getting that information from uh, and who was sharing that information with you. I mean, it is, I think about my trip to uh, the Blanford Cemetery, which was one of the largest Confederate cemeteries in the country. The remains of 30,000 Confederate soldiers are buried there. Um, and I went and spent the day uh, with the Sons of Confederate Veterans during a, uh, their Memorial Day celebration. And when I was there, it, it was a profoundly uh, clarifying experience because I got to see what the sort of contemporary manifestation of the lost cause looks like. And I got to uh, more fully understand how for some people, history is not uh, based on primary source documents or empirical evidence or historical fact, but it is a reflection of, of a story that they have been told. It is an heirloom again, that passed down over the course of generations. It is something that um, that reflects the uh, the way that they have been told a story and continue to tell a story uh, that shapes how they understand who they are in relation to the world. I should also say this is uh, well, since we are in Zoom land, you will like to hear my a two year old in the background who is the sound okay. and not having a, a an enjoyable. It's a beautiful noise, and we all understand. Um, we're just hoping we don't hear a lawnmower or a leaf blower, you know, out out back here. Um, when you were at the Blanford Cemetery, cemetery, you met people who who embraced a history that that they had been taught, and you you describe it as an heirloom. And sometimes when people have a treasured heirloom, they don't want to reassess its value. They're not interested in that. In the conversations that you had, which were sometimes prickly, do you think that people in some way did perhaps reassess that history? And did you, in, in your own estimation, reassess your, your view um, and your history and your understanding of a cemetery like that? I think for me, what happened, 
there, I gained a lot of clarity about how these people's minds are not necessarily going to be changed by uh, being presented with the facts or the truth about what the Confederacy was, right? So part of the insidiousness of white supremacy is that it takes an empirical statement and turns it into an ideological. So if I say the Confederacy was a treasonous uh, territory that seceded from the Union and raised an army predicated on maintaining and expanding the institution of slavery, um, in some spaces, especially in this sort of contemporary discourse, um, that would be perceived as me attempting to indoctrinate students with my political views, or me, uh, that, um, that it is somehow reflective of an ideological disposition. But it is in fact just reflective of the facts on the ground. It is reflective of what the Confederacy wrote for themselves in their primary source documents when they said that a state like Mississippi, you know, for example, in 1861, when it was seceding from the Union, said that our interests are thoroughly aligned with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest in the world. Right? They were quite explicit about why they were seceding from the Union, and they, they were not in any way vague about it. But, but it is not, but for so many people, again, it is not about that. So, so I'm actually, you know, I don't know, there are many people for whom you can present them with a, a, a you know, the information or the facts, and it won't change the mind. And we see an iteration of that today uh, in our contemporary political environment. But I also think there are a lot of people who just don't know and whose, whose sensibilities and whose understandings of this country might very well be shifted by that. I think of two women who I met when I was in uh, uh, at Monticello, and uh, Donna and Grace. And we were on the tour of Monticello together, and we were specifically on slavery at Monticello tour. And they, we had just gotten this sort of master class, pedagogical master class from the tour guide, a guy named David Thorson, who really laid out in the span of an hour the, the nature of Jefferson's relationship to slavery and the lives of enslaved people at Monticello. And I saw that these two women were having this really sort of visceral, emotional reaction to what they were saying. And I went up to them after, and I was like, hi, I'm, I'm Clint. I was wondering if I could talk with you and hear more about how you're sort of feeling after, after David shared his presentation. And they were like, man, you really took the shine off. Mm -hmm. I had, they said, I had no idea that Jefferson was slaves. I had no idea that Monticello was a plantation. And mind you, these are folks who bought plane tickets, who rented cars, who got hotel rooms, who came to this place from Georgia and Vermont, respectively, uh, as a sort of pilgrimage to see the, the home of the third president of the United States and one of our founding fathers, and had no conception of this place being the home of uh, an enslaved, of this place being a plantation, of a place that enslaved hundreds of people. And I think that that m moment is a microcosm for how profoundly so many people in this country don't even misunderstand, but don't even have like a beginning with which to understand or a foundation with which to understand how slavery impacted this country in any way that is commensurate with the actual uh, way that with the nature of its actual economic, social, and political impact. Um, and, and who's to say that, like, I don't know if that it, when Donna and Grace left um, and went back to their respective homes, their sense of, because their sense of Jefferson had changed, their sense of the country changed, and that shifted the way that they thought about who they were in relationship to this country. Um, but, but I do know, and I think we should take seriously, um, that a lot of people just don't have this information in the first place. And whether or not they do something with it ultimately isn't up to us. But I, but I do think it's important that, that this information is, uh, that we recognize that it is, there is something to be said for meeting people where they are, which is one of the things that I think the public historians like Nia Bates and Yvonne Holden at the Whitney Plantation and David Thorson and Monticello and uh, Damaris Obi in New York City all did so well, is that there's this sort of balancing act between a recognition that you should extend grace and generosity to people and meet them where they are because of the way that there has been a systemic and structural failure in their education, while also not holding back on what the truth of this country is, right? And that there has to be accountability for that. And I think that so much of what these public historians do so well is it's find that balance and, and to say, this might be difficult for you to hear, but it is important for you to hear it anyway. And we're going to I'm going to be on this journey of, of making sense of it alongside. You also visit Angola prison. You visit Gori Island. You um, take us on a tour, the reader on a tour through New York and help them understand the city of New York with new eyes. 
You could not have written this book without going to Louisiana, though. And anybody who follows you on what my mother calls the Twitter knows that uh, you love your family, you love soccer, and you love your home state of Louisiana. Um, and, and a place where there are plantations all over the place. And many of them are the sites of family reunions and weddings and things like this. But you went to a plantation, the Whitney Plantation, which is dedicated to helping people understand the lived experience of being enslaved. And one of the features is that the man who created the Whitney Plantation, um, to the consternation of his neighbors, decided to focus on children to help you understand what lives were like for people who were born into slavery and would likely die into slavery. And some of whom, as you visited the Garden of Angels, died quite young because you know the, the life was so hard. You were doing this as a young parent yourself. Um, is that one of the reasons you focused so much on, on the children at the Whitney Plantation that you wanted the reader to really think about their lives? Yeah. I. I... I worked on this book starting in May of 2017 uh, when I watched the Confederate statues come down in my hometown in New Orleans. And, you know, I was watching the statues of Robert E. Lee, P.G. D. Beauregard, Jefferson Davis, leaders of the Confederacy come down in this city that, um, that had raised me. And, and my son was born uh, that same month in May of 2017. And so my experience in writing this book is, is inextricably linked to having become a father to, to one young child and then two years later to another. And, and one of the things that was most interesting about having become a father and going to a place like the Whitney is that the experience of seeing how slavery specifically impacted children uh, was a much more, it was a profoundly visceral experience in a different sort of way than, than it might have been. There's a statue of an angel holding uh, mm -hmm. the child who's passed away, an infant who's passed away, and, and and it is impossible for me at that moment you know, when I have a two-year-old son, or an almost two-year-old son, and my wife was eight months pregnant with my daughter, for me to look at that and not consider what that meant for people living through that period. And, and also to, I think part of what the Whitney also did in really focusing on the children with the statuettes sort of uh, sitting and scattered throughout the uh, property, is that for so long in my own understanding of slavery, I thought of the sort of spectacle of cruelty. I thought of the physical abuse. I thought of the, the image, the famous image of the slave man with scars uh, etched across his body like a spider. Uh, and I thought of the, you know, watching fruits and this famous scene where Punta Quinte is being beat. You know, these are the depictions that we get Slavery, but for some reason, I had never fully considered. I don't think until I began the process of writing this book, the nature of family separation during slavery and what that meant. And while I can never, I can certainly never know what it meant. You know, to the extent that I can think about it and empathize. I remember sitting at the Whitney, sitting down on a bench, and just taking a moment and imagining what it would be like if I were in my home with my family, and I woke up. And my children were gone, had been disappeared overnight, and I had no idea where they were. And I had no idea if I might ever see them. And I can't even bring myself to fathom how I would, even saying it, you, you, you become full, right? I can't even bring myself to fathom what that. But part, but the part of what I more fully understood after going to a place like the Whitney, that this was the omnipresent reality, the omnipresent threat that hung over millions of enslaved people for every day of their lives for generations over the course of centuries was that you could be separated from the people you love at any moment from your children, from your husband, from your wife, from your parents, from your community, and and how devastating it is. Not only the, the physical act of separation very clearly, but the, the idea that that it could possibly happen at any moment. And so the psychological terror and the way that that psychological terror could be wielded uh, by enslavers um, gave, I, I had a much more profound understanding of it. And I think I had a much more, uh, a much deeper understanding of it because I was able to look at my own children, and consider what it would mean 
uh, if somebody threatened to take them away or, or, or did take them away. As America tries to figure out how to reckon with a differ, difficult and, and in some ways diabolical history, are there guideposts elsewhere? Mm-hmm. South Africa, over many years, held a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Other countries have done something similar. Um, I recently wrote an essay about Germany, which has monuments to the victims all over the country um, and stumbling stones that you see all over Berlin that give the name of someone, the date of their birth, um, the date of their death, and the fate that, that they encountered in life. Would something like that help America come to terms with a history like that? Is there something that we can learn from countries like Germany and South Africa, um, Rwanda, Argentina, uh, other countries that are looking over their shoulder at a very difficult history? I I, I absolutely think so. Um, And I think I've been thinking a lot specifically about the stumbling stones in Berlin um, and the tens of thousands of these stones that exist in the city and, and scattered throughout the country that that represented sort of different kinds of monuments, right? A sort of different kind of more dispersed sort of memorial uh, where you can't go to a Nike store, where you can't go to a, where you can't go to a yoga studio without walking and seeing these uh, golden brass bricks sort of slightly elevated off the ground and seeing, as you said, the names and dates of people who, who were sent to their death, who were pulled from what used to be these homes and had been turned now into restaurants or commercial buildings, or, or, or maybe they still are homes. And, and I think about what that does to a society collectively, where when, as you are moving throughout the world, as you are moving throughout the city, you are regularly and on a daily basis encountering reminders of what has been done and encountering reminders that these were not statistical abstractions, but these were people with names, people with lives, people who were born, people who died, people who love. Um, and, and that's not to say that Germany does not have its own issues with uh, mm-hmm. anti-Semitism. That's not to say Germany is a perfect of course. But it is to say that it is, a, I think, a really profound example of a place that takes seriously what a sort of collective, what the shaping of a collective memory and collective public consciousness around what has been done, what, what it means to, to work toward that so that there is not this uh, you know, chasm of, uh, of understanding about what was done in order to, that, that makes the landscape, the demographic landscape of Germany look the way that it does today. You know, like millions and millions and millions of Jewish people slaughtered. And, the, and what Germany's demography is, is like is, is very much shaped and animated by that history. And so I, I, I do think that Germany and, and South Africa and these other countries have a lot to us. And I think about what it would mean if we had an iteration of stumbling stones here in the United States. Like, what would it mean if we had markers of places that were sold, markers of places where auctions were held, markers of places where slave people were separated, of where uh, indigenous uh, families were removed, of where Japanese and American internment happened? Like, what would it mean to have these markers that remind us of uh, our collective history and the shame parts of our collective history? So that we can make public policy interventions and decisions that are more fully informed by the harm that has been done to different groups of people across our history. In reading your book, it's clear that you can you can love a country and still question its history. Um, you know, particularly when it's difficult. We only have about thirty seconds, and I just have one last very quick question. Reading this book, I wondered if you were going to get back in touch with Grace and Donna to find out mm-hmm. what if what they heard. You know, did did alter the course of their thinking in some way? That I would love to. Um, I don't think I have their contact information, unfortunately. Mm. Um, I have a Maybe they'll read the book and track you down. You know, I was trying to find them on Facebook. I was trying to. I looked all over, um, but it's hard to do Google Face from Georgia. It's uh, not a whole lot comes up. But but you, I have been reached out to by some of the folks featured in the book. Um, and and I just tried to do justice to the remarkable work that they that so many public historians have done, and and honor um, what so many of these people learned uh, alongside me. The book is how the word is passed. The author is Clint Smith, 
author, journalist, poet. It's been great to talk to you, Clint. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. And next week, uh, join my, uh, actually not next week, later today, join my colleague Michael Duffy at 3.30 Eastern today for a conversation with Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin about how her city is dealing with record-breaking temperatures and the coronavirus pandemic. You can always head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register and find out more information about upcoming programs. I'm Michelle Norris, columnist for The Washington Post. Thanks so much for joining us today. Have a glorious day.